First of all, I'd like to say thank you and welcome uh, to Community TV. I'm Lou Tuosto with Let's Talk. And this evening, we have a really exciting evening because we've got young people, young people that are doing uh, mock trials. And mock trials in Santa Cruz County have been around for several years. We have high school competitors. And what they're doing is they're bringing case information uh, like a legal beagle would do, and they're arguing these cases. Now the argument of these cases is quite exciting because there is a verdict and uh, somebody wins and somebody loses. But more importantly, the skills that our young people are creating in doing all this kind of neat thing, which is creating, uh, I think, a future for themselves to learn these skills more than anything, not necessarily be attorneys, they're doing. Well, tonight is the finals. Uh, tonight we have a couple very good guests with this that are going to talk about mock trials and we have the honor, Honorable Paul Maragonda and I'd have to say uh, thank you so much for being here uh, this evening. Uh, uh, my, my, pleasure, my pleasure, Lou. It's, uh, uh, the high school mock trial competition is a competition that's held throughout the state of California in different counties. Yes. And in Santa Cruz County it's been going on for more than 15 years and it involves most of our high schools and the high school students throughout the state are given the same problem. It is a fact situation, and it's a difficult fact situation. It's not something that is easy. Talk, let's talk about that for a second, because uh, I know that uh, some of the basic kinds of things, when you go out and you do one of these things, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're pretty straightforward. This isn't. This is some complex issues. So the kids have to have their thinking caps on. Yes. It's doing something that probably they've never done in their lifetime because on the spot they're actually thinking on how to think uh, you know, better right on the spot given the information. And it's information, but they're just not regurgitating a bunch of stuff. They're doing real stuff. They're being creative. They're having to think on their feet. They're given a fact pattern, they're given certain case, case law to work with, but they have to really know how to think quickly, think on their feet, consider a situation. Uh, the judges, the opposing attorneys, people are going to throw curveballs at them, and they have to be prepared to address that. And asking a 16, 17-year-old kid to be able to do that is really, really takes a lot of mental discipline, takes a lot of uh, hard, hard work. Yes. And uh, throughout the years that I've been doing it, I've, I've worked as a scoring attorney, I've, I've served as a mentor attorney, I've served as a presiding judge. I'm consistently impressed every year at the skill level, the hard work, the ability of these kids to think on their feet, yes. and to be able to really, really do a stellar job I'm always impressed every time how prepared the kids are. Many times they're putting on a presentation better than I've seen in court or better than I, I, I've watched attorneys put on yes. in court. It's that kind of polish. And this is not something that is telling them, oh, hey, I'm going to be a lawyer later in life. Whatever they end up doing, this experience, this practical knowledge that they receive in dealing with uh, tricky situations, uh, analyzing things on the fly, really thinking things through, serves them in whatever they choose to do. What would you say in terms of uh, prep time, uh, Des Marigondo, uh, that the kids put in uh, for getting ready for a trial and how many hours uh, of, uh, of, of, I guess, studying the cases and getting all the things ready that need to be done so that they do the right job, they do a good job, and of course they go on to, you know, the, the state finals, they go on to nationals, but our kids locally, do they, they start six months in advance, three These, months in advance? They, 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 they'll start in September, they'll start in October, they put in hundreds of hours. I kind of liken this to these kids. Oh, wait, doing hun hundreds? Hundreds of hours. Oh, wow. I liken this to, okay. to the students that are doing this. This is their winter sport. Sure. Some kids may be doing soccer, some may be doing sure. basketball, sure. volleyball. These are doing these kids are doing mock trial. Tremendous. I understand too that uh, many of our finest uh, uh, institutions, uh, universities, look at uh, mock trials on uh, transcripts and they see that the kids have put those hours in. And certainly these days, with the competition that it is, a 4.5 is not good enough anymore. No. You've got to do this kind of stuff. You do. You, you have to have the 4.5. You have to come from a, a great school, a great area. We've got some wonderful schools in Santa Cruz County. But tell us a little bit about that and, and, and uh, how it, uh, I guess, augments what they are as students when they're going to college and when they're applying. When they've done mock trials, it's it's a le it's a leadership quality, it's initiative, it's something that the university 
admissions counselors look at. It shows that you're willing to step into something that requires a lot of work. It shows that you're willing to step into something that um, requires leadership. Um, I know that uh, uh, Scotts Valley High School, a number of kids that I've worked with or have watched, and I know uh, some of whom are here tonight, uh, they have gotten into good schools and they've done well because they've been portrayed as leaders. This is not something that's viewed as a, an easy, easy process. It takes hundreds and hundreds of hours. I mean, literally, they spend hundreds of hours, nights, weekends, mm. preparing for this. Because there are so many nuances, so many little details that happen, and so many things can change in the course of a trial. Depends on perhaps the kind of judge, the judge that you have, the questions that, that he or she asks. Sure. Perhaps one team opposing you takes a different tack. You have to be able to think about that. So when college uh, college counselors look at that and they see, hey, how did this person, he, he or she was involved in mock trial, this is something that really gets a lot of positive attention. And especially, as you said, today's very, very competitive world. Um, that, the mock trial provides a very big edge. I, I could see this as something very significant with, uh, again, uh, the, the kind of skills that young people develop. Uh, we all are in some kind of debate, so to speak. We're trying to convince our spouse to buy the green car instead of the yellow car, and we're all kind, do, doing all kinds of things like that. Uh, and so the skills that are developed here are wonderful. Yeah. Uh, where do you see our county going? Do we compete pretty competitively yes. on, the, on the state level, on the national level? Where do we go? And how might, how might we improve those skills? And how might our listening audience, let's say, get involved in some fashion to be able to help the kids uh, improve so that next year, instead of being ranked wherever they were ranked, they get a little bit of a higher ranking. What would you say that would be something that it could help with? We are always very, very competitive on the state level, and uh, we always manage to do very, very well. But what would be great to see, what was, needs to be encouraged is that every high school, every single high school in Santa Cruz County should be fielding a mock trial team. That should be our goal, is to have every single team field. So, so they're not they're not, not all involved right now. Not 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 every school in the uh, county is involved in mock trial, and that's this is what we need to achieve. I think one of the great things would be if we had all of our schools and uh, what we have ten of them in uh, uh, Santa Cruz County. If we had all ten high schools and uh, well, maybe in PC, if we have eleven or twelve. If we had every sure. high school, uh, the competition would be better. I got to click on it. I'm going to turn you over to Bob. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Judge Marigondo. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank Perfect you. Time. Good, thank you. And we have another interview today, uh, tonight, and, and we have the, the district attorney, uh, Bob Lee, and he is one of the coaches, but he also uh, does a bunch of other stuff with young people. And thank you for being on the show this evening, Bob. Thank you very much for, for being here. And uh, we, you've probably heard part of the interview with Judge Marigondo, and it is his courtroom, so he's kind of the most uh, uh, the, uh, normal person to do a bulk of that, but certainly you're a big part of our legal community, a huge part of our legal community, and a little bit about your background. You are a local uh, high school graduate, uh, of course high school graduate, but law, school, law graduate as well, but from Soquel High School, and so you are as local as local can be. Well, I was born here, and I went to the local elementary schools. I'm a graduate of SoCal High, and okay. now, 30 years later or so, I'm now a coach for SoCal High's mock trial team. Very good. It's almost like the full circle has happened with me, because when I went to SoCal High, uh, I was on the speech and debate team, and now, 30 years later, I'm helping kids learn how to become better speakers. How does uh, speech and debate uh, kinds of things like Lincoln Douglas and those kinds of things that you probably engaged in when you were in high school, how do they differ from the mock trials that we're doing here? And, and I'll, I will ask this too, because I love the speech and debate uh, teams that they have over the hill. Uh, I've got some exposure to that. Actually, my son uh, uh, was there. Uh, for four years in high school. Uh, how do they differ, and, and do you see that possibly coming back to our community, about? Well, I, I always hope that uh, different programs come back. I think a speech and debate program would be wonderful in our community, but mock court has a lot of similarities. It's really kind of replaced it in a more modern version. It's about critical thinking. Yes. It's about standing on your feet and being able to persuade somebody that you're reasoning and your thought process is correct, sure. and it's about overcoming those typical things that we see with many speakers, mostly adults, 
uh, being able to speak logically, coherently, and without nervous. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Do you see that uh, we've got an exceptional team this year that might go the distance, or are they uh, above average? Or of course, you're one of the coaches, so I, you kind of lean I, towards I, the. I'm completely biased towards my team. Okay. Uh, no, I think all the teams are, are wonderful, actually. You know, we, are, we let me give you an example. I'll just use somebody from our team. We have a freshman girl that's doing one of the hardest things about mock court, which is the pretrial motion. And uh, she's a freshman. Well, tell, tell us what, uh, now that's a legalese term. What is a pretrial motion? What's that mean? What are, what are they doing in the in, mock trial? In, in mock trial, there's a, a, a fact situation where somebody does some acts and he's being accused of committing a crime. You have a prosecution team and you have a defense team. And the pretrial motion is a motion that we normally see in court uh, where the, either the defense or the prosecution tries to take a piece of evidence and get it so it's not considered in the trial. So it's basically taken out of the trial. In this case, it's a Miranda question. It's whether a person's statement should be used in court or whether it's improper and should be not used in court. Now, all the kids uh, that are doing this nationwide or competing have the same uh, kind of stuff that they're doing. And so the exact it's- same problem. Okay, so they're, they're basically honing in on the skills uh, that they have and they're perfecting those skills by a lot of other kinds of things that they're doing, probably a lot of prep work, but it's more than just prep work because obviously attorneys just don't memorize things. It's their presentation. It's their, give me the fill in the blanks. What is it that you like to see in a potential mock trial attorney youngster that you could see as a potential for being an, an attorney? Well, you, you want somebody who can look at an idea. Just forget about being an attorney for a second. We're teaching these kids life skills. And I tell these kids all the time that I'm not here to teach you how to win mock court. Uh, of course, you know, they're competitive and they want to win. Yeah. And there's part of yeah. me as a coach that has an ego that wants to win. But there's a much bigger life lesson here. And it's basically teaching kids how to take a problem, how to look at that problem, mm -hmm. how to be, how to give logical and, uh, and, and, uh, persuasive reasoning yes and so whether it's a mock court issue or whether you're applying for a job years later or, or you're trying to convince school, your wife to get the green card instead of the blue card that's yeah right. <laughs> that's I mean, anything you could, you could it could be anything yeah. and, and we see that what we're really teaching is leadership skills because mm -hmm. when kids can communicate better mm -hmm. and they don't feel the nerves and they understand how to take a, an issue and then develop their reasoning process and be able to per persuasively communicate that to people sure. they get empowered and we constantly see these mock court kids, whether from Harbor High, Watsonville, Santa Cruz, or Soquel, yes. uh, become leaders in their own peer group. And that's always important in our community because we have a lot of issues and a lot of problems, whether it's a dog park on the beach or a Frisbee golf course behind Soquel High School, sure. or something more importantly about what to do with plastics in the ocean or guns in our nation. Yes. Uh, these are our future leaders who can actually take those points, rally people around it, be able to communicate those ideas and, and try to, to persuade people that their point is the, is the most correct one. Oh, excellent. And, and there certainly are, are arguments on both sides, right. but uh, it, it certainly that's the, the system, the, the, you know, the community that we live in. Uh, and, and I think, you know, uh, leadership like that is a thing that makes our community great or, and greater, uh, you know, as we develop those skills in our young people. And it, it really starts with public speaking. It does. Uh, the power of public speaking is yes. something that I think is is being diminished just because of the nature of the internet. Yes. And we are really seeing uh, an emphasis in mm -hmm. making sure that these kids can actually use the, the power of persuasion uh, to be creative, uh, to uh, uh, be somebody that uh, people respond to. Sure. Um, and that's something that uh, we are, as coaches, really feel creative about. Sure, sure. Um, I've had three attorneys from the, my previous experience in mock court yeah. about 15 years ago. I did it for two years at Soko High about 15 years ago. That became attorneys, three uh -huh. kids that uh -huh. became attorneys. Yeah. And I really, it would not surprise me that I have three or four kids that become attorneys uh, out of this group. It's Wait. just a wonderful feeling to have. That's awesome. Do, 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 um, do you see, we talked a little bit about this, but do you see uh, the possibility of speech and debate um, and it, how might our community members that are watching the show maybe encourage I don't know, would it be administrators at schools, would it be teachers, would it be parents, for that to come back? Because I think that's an important issue as well, uh, for sure, uh, you know, with uh, developing those same kinds of skills. Obviously, you know, your case in point, you're the perfect example of a huge success story. I mean, you are the DA, you're not an assistant DA, you're in charge of the whole department, and you're, again, a, a local, uh, and you did it in speech and debate. 
Uh, do you see that coming back? That kind of excites me if, if, if that were to come back because I think I, I've seen it with my son and he was on the debate team uh, and it did some wonderful things for him. And I coached uh, and I got to watch the kids uh, do some real interesting things and flow and you know, tell who won at the end of the debate. And, I, and it was a growing process for me. And I was blown away that after, I know with my son, you know, he had, he had friends that many of them went to law school uh, and many of them got into business. And virtually all of them, I mean, a, a huge amount, were super successful. I think it was because of speech and debate, their ability to communicate. So the skills that you're developing, do you see that possibly coming back? And Well, it, it takes um, uh, an individual to come back and uh, basically start it. And uh, Sukkah Heights, for example, they had a man named John Wasserberger when I was in high school there. Mm -hmm. And he ran the speech and debate program. Mm -hmm. He actually ran it with Larry Haddis, who's one of the Sukkah High mock court coaches now. Yeah, no, he, he, was, he was here tonight. He yes, is here tonight. He yes. is here tonight. Okay. And, and they built this program into the biggest club at Sukkah High School. There was roughly 100 people in speech and debate. And um, matter of fact, Sukkah High teams, uh, there were numerous people, including my brother, that got full ride scholarships from speech and debate. Oh, wow. And, and so... Well, so let's say, let's say that again. That, that's kind of a teaser, and I love it, because all us parents, I've got my three kids, and they've all gone through college, but we're all looking for, can you get a scholarship? Can you get a partial scholarship? You know, where might we save some money if you do something that you need to develop anyways? So when you are successful in either speech and debate or, let's say, mock trials, there's a possibility that that would enhance your chances of getting scholarship money for college. Absolutely. Could you talk about that? Well, it, it, it does because there's college speech and debate programs. And yeah. even though some high schools that don't have the programs, a lot of colleges do. Yes. So they're always looking for talented individuals to fill in those gaps. It's just like recruiting for a basketball or football team. They're looking for the talented kids who can look at a, a, a a issue and be a critical thinker about that issue and persuade others that their opinion is the appropriate opinion. Uh, but more importantly, again, it um, there was when I said there was a hundred people at Soka High, I, I mean that uh, as a busload. And sure. um, of all the hundred or sixty people, if you had any kids that are, or any adults that are watching Soka High right now that were part of the speech and debate program, they would agree with me. And they've told me this sure. numerous times. Sure. The speech and debate program at Soka High School was the best program they had at Soka High School. Mm, wow. And whether you were an engineer or end up being a, a carpet layer or a um, um, general contractor, every one of them says, I've used those skills in my life. And it's, that's, that's what high school should do for you and programs should do is be able to take a, a skill you learn there and use it to your advantage for the rest of your life. Oh. And Wonderful. that's what we're trying to do here, okay. uh, yeah. and uh, I'm very proud to be part of it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, just one last partying comment. Again, what can our listening audience do to help uh, the mock trial folks and people that are supporting mock trials in Santa Cruz County? Uh, parents certainly are always involved. You know, they're always you know, running the flag for their kids and doing the rah-rah. But uh, can they show up? Can they uh, write sure. their uh, school administrators, say, let's enhance that? Can they donate? What, what can they do? What can folks out there, the listening audience that might be listening to the show? Well, I, I'm in law enforcement. And so I always tell the community the number one thing you do to help fight crime is get involved with kids. Yes. That's the number one thing. If everybody got involved with kids at some level, whether it's high school, secondary schools, after schools, preschools, um, you know, just supporting kids in their endeavors. Uh, we'd have a much lower crime rate. And so for public speaking, I think that you ask the superintendent to say that, look, we want to put a speech program together. And we'll start with a simple speech contest. Yes. And uh, like the Lions Club, they still believe have their contests. But we, should, we need more of that to basically allow kids that don't play necessarily uh, violin or football or whatever to have a, an avenue where they can um, basically uh, improve uh, their social skills uh, their communication skills yes. and uh, their leadership skills. Excellent, excellent. Well, perfect example of a, a success story. Uh, the district attorney, the district attorney, Bob Lee, thank you so much for being with us this My evening pleasure. and good luck in the final competition. I think they're giving the awards out right now. Oh, very good. Well, I want to get in there and uh, we, we uh, will come back in a few minutes uh, it, once the finals are happening uh, and done and then we're going to interview the folks that won. Good, so, good. Thank you so much. I, I know the kids be so happy. They're so happy that you're here. Yeah. Uh, it really um, illuminates what their, their whole their hard work for the last three months. Yeah. Um, it, it just gives them a chance to show the rest of the community that uh, this is an important event. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
All right, to the uh, parties, uh, you must complete your presentations within the specified time limits. Uh, the clerk, as she has noted, will signal you as your time for each section. The presentation begins to run out. When your total time for each section runs out, you will be stopped even if you haven't finished, and the attorneys must call four witnesses. This is a bench trial, a court trial. At the end of the trial, I will render a verdict of guilty or not guilty in relation to the charge brought. The teams will be rated based on the quality of the performances independent of my verdict. Barring any unforeseen circumstances, no recess will be called. If for any reason a recess is necessary, the team members should remain in their appropriate places and should have no contact with spectators. Please remember that the objections are limited to the California mock trial simplified rules of evidence located in the case packet. Now, if there are no questions, uh, we are going to begin with the pretrial motions. Uh, pretrial attorneys, any questions before we begin? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, now, uh, both sides are going to have four minutes to present their arguments, and the defense will begin. I will interrupt to ask clarifying questions, and time spent answering my questions is not going to be included in the four minute time limit. At the conclusion of your arguments, each side will be offered two minutes of rebuttal time. Please remember that the rebuttal time is to be used to counter your opponent's arguments, not to raise new issues. Counsel for the defense, ready to begin? Yes, Your Honor. Please begin. The defense moves to suppress Adrian Vega's statement that was made to police while she was in the back of the police car as it was obtained in violation of her Fifth Amendment rights. In the case of Miranda versus Arizona, the court held that the government is required to inform defendants of their Fifth Amendment rights prior to a custodial interrogation. As found in Thompson versus Keohane, in concluding if an interrogation was custodial, two questions must be answered. What were the circumstances of the interrogation? And given these circumstances, would a reasonable person have felt that she was at liberty to terminate the interrogation and leave? The court will see that because of the totality of circumstances under which Adrian Vega's questioning took place, Miranda warnings were warranted, and their absence made the interrogation unlawful. In the case of People versus Herdan, the court held that several factors are significant in determining custody. These factors include the site of the interrogation, the length and form of questioning, and whether the investigation focused on one suspect. The interrogation of Adrian Vega lasted 30 minutes and culminated in a direct accusation of Vega. In addition, it took place in the back of a locked police cruiser by an officer who admitted to focusing on Vega. Your Honor, it's clear from the facts of April 19th and the law established in People v. Herdan that Adrian Vega was in a custodial interrogation. Well, yeah, but in looking at that, wasn't there just one officer involved in the interrogation here? Um, yes, Your Honor. Only one officer, Officer okay. Wright, questioned um, Ms. Vega. However, Officer Jackson, who is a very physically threatening uh, figure, was also present at the uh, interrogation. But the, that officer didn't ask a single question or make any kind of uh, statement that would elicit an incriminating statement. Uh, you're absolutely correct, um, Your Honor. Officer Jackson did not speak to Ms. Vega at all. Um, in fact, he did not uh, participate in any of the pleasantries that Officer Wright um, used to calm Ms. Vega. Well, you focus a lot on the Hare Dan case, which is a 1974 case. Um, wouldn't you agree, perhaps, that at least at the outset, uh, the contact between the Officer Wright <coughs> and the defendant wasn't really coercive at all? Um, yes, I would agree that um, the uh, interactions with, uh, between Officer Wright and Ms. Vega um, were at one point um, friendly. However, over the course of the uh, evening, this friendliness disappeared and the interrogation became uh, coercive. How so? Um, several factors contributed uh, to this coercive environment. Um, as a factor, uh, including the factors I previously mentioned, um, but in addition, um, being placed in the back of a locked police car is um, an objective indicia of arrest, as also held in um, the case of uh, Herdan. 
But he wasn't told that the back seat was locked, was he? I uh, no, you're absolutely correct, Your Honor. <coughs> However, um, it is common knowledge that the back of a uh, cage car is locked, and thus it's a thus a reasonable person would have known that it was locked. All right, go on. Thank you, Your Honor. The case of U.S. versus Craighead provide the court with additional factors which can contribute to a custodial interrogation. In the case of Craighead, the court held that quote the behavior or the behavior of police officials can create a quote police dominated atmosphere thus constituting arrest. The factors that led to this atmosphere were the number of police officials and threat they imposed, whether the suspect was isolated, and whether the suspect was informed that she was free to leave. At six and a half feet tall, weighing 250 pounds, Officer Jackson acted solely as a physical threat, threat on the night of Adrian Vega's arrest. Jackson refused to engage in any pleasantries with either the defendant or Officer Wright, or even contribute to the investigation. Yeah, but this is a little different than Craig's had. I mean, this is not somebody that was kept in a storage room with a bunch of officers. This is out in the open, out in the yard with, you know, just one officer. Um, the, the argument the defense is making is not that um, the questioning outside of the police car in the open was not custodial. However, um, inside the back of a locked police car was custodial. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, while under the threat of Officer Jackson, Vega was then isolated and placed in the back of a locked police car without her consent. In the subsequent interrogation, Ms. Vega was not once informed that she was free to leave. Your Honor, once again, the environment of Adrian Vega's interrogation would have made any reasonable person feel in custody. The circumstances of Vega's interrogation are not subject to exemptions found in other cases. In the case of Berkmer versus McCarty, the court held that the length of routine police questionings, such as traffic stops, is limited, and thus the suspect's freedom of action is not significantly restrained. However, Your Honor, this exemption does not apply to this case, as after giving a complete account of the events of April 19th, Ms. Vega was then coerced into a second 30-minute long interrogation inside the police cruiser. One minute. After this, well, fail oh, just do you, you believe that the initial conversation that Ms. Vega had with Officer Wright was an interrogation. Uh, the, I, or, or, could I mean, you specify as to what you mean by the initial well, conversation? When they first start uh, talking <coughs> and, and they're, they're discussing things, Officer Wright and Ms. Vega, um, do you believe that that initially is an interrogation? Uh, no, they're talking mean, about swimming and the, 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 the <coughs> swim team and all of that. Are you saying that that's a functional equivalent of interrogation? Uh, no, Your Honor, uh, I'm not arguing that. And I agree that um, the initial conversation between Officer Wright and Ms. Vega was um, a routine police questioning, much like the questioning of Tony DeLuca or any of the other witnesses that evening. However, um, as found in the case of uh, People versus Aguilera, um, over time, um, a, a environment can become custodial. Correct. May I continue? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, after this failed to produce the evidence that Officer Wright was attempting to procure, he continued his questioning. At this point, the restrictions on Adrian Vega's freedom had only grown over the course of the evening, and no reasonable person would have felt in control of the situation. Your Honor, in determining if an envi interrogation environment is custodial, the totality of circumstances must be examined. Which case tells us that? Uh, Thompson, the case of Thompson versus Keohan. All right. Uh, uh, Adrian Vega's statement was given in a custodial interrogation, an interrogation into which she was coerced and in which she was not aware of her Fifth Amendment rights. In the name of upholding the Constitution and preserving the rights of those it protects, this court cannot admit Adrian Vega's statement as evidence against her. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Counsel for the prosecution? Yes, Your Honor. And for the convenience of the scoring judges, again, my name is Rachel Zhang, spelled Z-H-A-N-G. Good evening, Your Honor. The defendant, Adrian Vega, made self-incriminating statements on the night of April 19, 2012. 
At that time, Officer Kelly Wright was not required to read the defendant her Miranda rights, which were established in 1966 in the United States Supreme Court case of Miranda v. Arizona. Miranda held that before a custodial interrogation, people must be informed of their Fifth Amendment rights. Hence, the Miranda rights were created. But Miss Vega was not due these rights. The statements she made to Officer Wright must be admitted into trial today because one, she was not in custody at the time, and two, she was not subjected to a custodial interrogation. In Thompson v. Keohane, the United States Supreme Court listed essential inquiries that determine whether a person is in custody. One of these essential inquiries looks at the totality of circumstances to determine whether a reasonable person would have felt at liberty to terminate the interrogation and leave. The United States Supreme Court cases of Yarbrough versus Alvarado and Oregon versus Mathiasson establish free will as a factor that must be considered in the totality of circumstances. What about the Aguilera situation where uh, a, a situation can be, you know, uh, all fine, and all of a sudden, as it evolves, it becomes custodial. Isn't that kind of what happened here, it could be argued? Your Honor, that is a factor that should be considered. However, it is not what, fa what happened in this case. The situation never became coercive in Ms. Vegas' case. There were never any physical restraints. There were no handcuffs. There were no threats, and no weapons drawn. Isn't though the fact that someone ends up in a police car, in the back of a car, and the car is locked and they can't get out, isn't that putting someone in a situation where for all intents and purposes they wouldn't feel free to leave? No, Your Honor, not necessarily. This situation of the locked car is similar to the situation in Green versus Superior Court, the first situation specifically, Your Honor. In Green v. Superior Court, the defendant in that case was questioned by multiple officers in a room that he did not know was locked. Yet the court still held that the evidence did not compel the conclusion that the defendant could not have left whenever he had wanted to. Your Honor, the same reasoning applies to Ms. Vega's case and shows that she was not in custody, custody at the time. She could have asked to leave, but she didn't. She could have questioned her circumstances, but she never did. Is there a requirement that someone has to ask to leave in order to be able to assert that they're not in custody? That is not a requirement, Your Honor, but looking at the totality of circumstances, that is one of the factors that should be considered. Well, all right, go on. Your Honor, going back to the factor of free will, in the cases of Yarbrough and Mathiasson, those court's holdings make it clear that Miranda rights were not required when a person goes to the police station voluntarily, even if there are police pressures. Now, uh, well, that, that wasn't the case here. I mean, the, the person walks home and there's a patrol car in his front yard. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to say I voluntarily went somewhere. Your Honor, a reasonable person, which is a standard that we must look at, would not have felt coerced to go sit in the patrol car. A reasonable person could have asked to go do something else, such as look for keys or try to get into the house, but instead, Miss Vega consented and agreed to sit in the patrol car. And in the, in the uh, Alvarado case, that defendant was 17 years old, similar to the situation we have with uh, Miss Vega here. Yes, Your Honor, but the court in Yarbrough decided that age and uh, prior criminal history are not factors that should be considered when determining custody. In the California case of People versus Hurden, the court listed significant factors of the custody test with regards to the totality of circumstances. Now, one factor was the site of the questioning, and the second factor was whether or not the questioning focused on the suspect. Now, Officer Wright's questioning did focus on Ms. Vega, but in Beckwith versus the United Minutes. States, the United States Supreme Court ruled that though the defendant was the focus of the investigation, he was still not subjected to a custodial interrogation. 
And Your Honor, assuming arguendo that the defendant was even in custody, she was still not subjected to a custodial interrogation. In Rhode Island versus Innis, the United States Supreme Court defined interrogation for Miranda purposes as any words or actions on the part of the police that the police should know are reasonably likely to elicit an incriminating response from the suspect. Well, do you, do, but don't you think at the point where you ask, uh, gee, I think you're the one that drove the car that struck the bicyclist, that is something that is designed to elicit an incriminating response, wouldn't you agree? Not necessarily, Your Honor. This statement, which was, well, we think that it's possible that you drove the car that struck the bicyclist on Skyline and Grand. This statement is not an interrogating statement. It is more investigative. It is more a statement of fact, not meant to elicit an incriminating response. In fact, this situation is like the situation in Berkmer versus McCarty. In that case, we have questioning about whether or not the defendant had been drinking or whether or not the defendant had uh, used any substances. Yeah, but this isn't a traffic stop like you had in Berkmer. I mean, that, that was where they drew the distinction in Berkmer was that they pulled the person over for a traffic stop, talked to him, found out that uh, he's been drinking, and then that's the hook that they used. Um, this is a little bit different. Um, I think Innes is real clear. Wouldn't you agree that, I mean, anything that you do, anything that you say or do that becomes the functional equivalent of interrogation is not permitted. Uh, yes, Your Honor. However, there are two cases that are similar to this situation. And the Berkmer situation is similar in the, in the way that the officer was asking, have you been drinking? Have you been taking any kind of substance? And those would draw perhaps eliciting, perhaps elicit incriminating <coughs> responses, yet it was still not a custodial situation. The other simula similar situation, Your Honor, is the case of Oregon versus Mathiasson, where the officers brought Mathiasson in, or Mathiasson chose to go there, and then they told Mathiasson that they had found his fingerprints, but they falsely told him. And that would normally draw a confession, and it did in the case of Oregon versus Mathiasson, but it was still not a custodial situation. Your Honor, Miss Vega made a self-incriminating statement about running over and almost killing Cameron Douglas. This crucial piece of evidence must be admitted into evidence in trial today. In Bergamer versus McCarty, the United States Supreme Court held, what to be in custody, a person's freedom must be significantly restrained. But Miss Vega's freedom was not significantly restrained. She was not in custody at the time. She was not subjected to a custodial interrogation. Your Honor, the people respectfully ask that you admit the defendant's statements in trial today. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. All right, uh, Mr. Bach, uh, rebuttal from the uh, defendant. Yes, Your Honor. And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Tyler Bach. Your Honor, opposing counsel has cited the case of Miranda versus Arizona. However, she failed to mention that in the case of uh, Miranda versus Arizona, the court held that custody can be established by mental stress, just like the mental stress which would have been created by the imposing figure of Officer Jackson. In addition, Your Honor, opposing counsel has mentioned the case of Oregon versus Mathiasson. However, in the case of Mathiasson, the defendant voluntarily came to the police station in order to be questioned. However, Vega was ambushed at her house by police officers. In addition, Mathiasson was not arrested the day of his interrogation, despite making a full confession. Vega, however, was arrested after a series of increasingly more restrictive actions by the officers. In addition, Your Honor, opposing counsel has stated that Vega's voluntary entrance to the police car uh, demonstrates uh, that, she, that it was not a custodial interrogation. However, Officer Wright closed the door on Vega without any prompting after Vega had already expressed reluctance by uh, leaving her feet outside the car despite the cold. It, but, you know, he was doing it, wasn't he as a convenience? And uh, 
you know, again, uh, where Officer Jackson wasn't inside the car, was he? No, Your Honor, he was not. And um, although, while I agree with you that it was initially a um, offer of convenience to allow Ms. Vega to sit inside the police car, um, Ms. Vega was per had demonstrated that she was perfectly comfortable mm -hmm. with sitting on the edge of the police car and until Officer Wright closed the door on her without any prompting whatsoever. May I continue? Yes. Thank you. In addition, opposing counsel has stated the absence of uh, drawn weapons or handcuffs. However, in deter determining your decision tonight, you must focus on the facts available. And the fact was there were objective indicia of arrest, such as the locked back of a police car. In addition, Your Honor, um, opposing counsel has stated the, the case of People versus Aguilera. However, the court held that in this case, that by the time the response was given, the environment had become coercive. Your Honor, in spite of the prosecution's attempt to argue in favor of admitting Ms. Vegas' statement, it is clear from both the facts of the situation mm -hmm. and the court's previous rulings that, uh, that Ms. Vegas' statement cannot be used as evidence against her. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Zang, uh, rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> Your Honor, to determine custody interrogation, we must look at the totality of circumstances. My opposing counsel tries to paint this picture of totality of circumstances using the case of United States versus Craighead. But that case is factually dissimilar from the case at bar today. There were over six armed officials in that case, only two officials with Ms. Vega, and only one of whom was actually questioning Ms. Vega. Now, Officer Jackson was not intimidating. A reasonable person would not have felt intimidated by Officer Jackson's presence because he was 15 feet away and was not doing anything to make himself more apparent, more intimidating. He was doing his job as a partner by standing by. Now, as Your Honor pointed out, he did not partake in the questioning. Now, one of the other factors that is that plays a big role is the locked car but this is not a significant restraint because it parallels to the case in green versus superior court and it does not become a restraint after the door closes in fact there is no difference between the situation with the door open and the door closed unlike what my opposing counsel argued the miss vega willingly sat down but was not showing her uh, opposition to the questioning by having her feet outside. Yeah, but she couldn't leave once the door was closed. She was locked in there, and uh, she was completely at the whim of the off of Officer Wright. Your Honor, while she may not have been able to leave on her own, she still could have asked to leave. A reasonable person in Miss Vega's circumstance should not have felt so intimidated or so restricted as to the point where they could not even ask to leave which makes her not in a custodial situation. Your Honor, the entire conversation was an investigative conversation. Pleasantries were exchanged, and there were no firearms drawn. There were no physical threats. Officer Jackson was not intimidated. Now, because Ms. Vega was not in custody, because she was not subjected to a custodial interrogation, because her freedom was not significantly restrained, the people respectfully ask that you deny the defense's motion. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Zane. <coughs> Counsel have properly stated the standard. Was the defendant in custody? And if so, was there an interrogation here? Second part is easy to answer for the court because uh, Rhode Island versus Ennis is very clear that any words or action that are designed to elicit an incriminating response are interrogation. The uh, statement by Officer Wright to <clears throat> Ms. Vega, uh, we believe that uh, you're the one that was driving the car that caused the accident, that, that's clearly designed uh, to elicit an incriminating statement would be found to be interrogation. So the key factor for the court to decide is whether this in fact uh, was a situation in which Adrian Vega was in custody. 
And as the United States Supreme Court has told us in Thompson versus Keohane, a 1995 case, it is a mixed question of law and fact. And so the court has to consider what were the circumstances surrounding the interrogation, and given those circumstances, what a reasonable person have felt here. She was not at liberty to terminate the interrogation and leave. In this case, you have the, uh, the defendant who is surprised to see that there is an officer there and a police car. Uh, there is the presence of Officer Jackson, some larger officer, but the court gives that little weight. Uh, doesn't seem to really factor too much in. The uh, court is concerned, though, about the situation as it evolves. And I think People versus Aguilera, the 1996 case, is instructive on this because a situation can start out innocuous and become coercive under the circumstances. And uh, based on what has been presented in the case law, I believe that is the situation that occurred here. And I believe that as the discussion went on, as the door was locked, as Ms. Vega was kept in the car, the situation became more coercive. So I think in that s scenario, with these facts, the court uh, would find that the defendant was in custody at the time then that she was functionally interrogated by Officer Wright, and the court would grant the motion uh, to suppress that uh, statement. So uh, the statements of Ms. Vega are uh, excluded. All right, now um, we are at the stage where we will proceed to the trial evidence. Uh, Parties want to switch seats? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zank. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Your Honor, may the prosecution retrieve the diagram of this opening statement? Yeah. Yes, you may. In this case, the people uh, versus Adrian Vega, the people of the state of California have charged the defendant, Adrian Vega, with violation of vehicle code section 20001, subsection A, failure to perform a duty following an accident uh, causing death or injury, a felony. Uh, to that charge, the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. Uh, Prosecution or defense, is there any physical evidence that you wish to present for inspection or for stipulation? Yes, Your Honor. I wish to present this diagram and pre-mark it for purposes of identification as People's Exhibit A. All right. Is there any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. That would be so more. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. At this point, we will go into the opening statements. And are, are the people prepared to present their opening statement to the court? Yes, Your Honor. All right, please proceed. Your Honor, in the course of the opening statement, may I walk back to court? Yes. Thank you. And for the convenience of the court, my name is Giselle Khan. On April 19th, a car racing through a stop sign slammed into Cameron Douglas and changed his life forever. The driver of the car was required by the California Vehicle Code, Section 20001A, to stop, check to see if Mr. Douglas were injured, and to provide him with reasonable assistance if he were. The prosecution will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the driver of this car, Adrian Vega, did none of these things and is guilty of felony hit and run. Cameron Douglas was riding his turquoise bicycle through the intersection of Skyline and Grand when he was crashed into by a car. Mr. Douglas recognized the car and identified the driver as Adrian Vega. Mr. Douglas was seriously injured in this accident. His right knee was shattered. In the past, he has competed worldwide in triathlons. However, he will no longer be able to do so due to permanent damage to his right knee from this accident. This permanent injury makes this crime a felony. Mr. Douglas will further testify that the driver of the vehicle did not stop or offer any assistance. Tony DeLuca, who lives with the Vega family, 
will testify that he was in the passenger seat of the car that hit Mr. Douglas. He will testify that Adrian Vega was driving that night, and Adrian Vega was driving recklessly. Mr. DeLuca felt a bump large enough to cause him to believe the defendant had hit something, but the defendant refused to stop the car. Quinn Liu saw the accident and will testify that Cameron Douglas was hit by the left front bumper of the car. She was able to see the driver. She was wearing a cardinal and gold baseball cap and a white t-shirt. She also obtained a partial license plate number, SLC86. Ms. Lee will testify that after hitting Cameron Douglas, the car slowed down, then sped away. The driver knew she hit someone. Officer Kelly Wright will testify that she arrived on the scene and interviewed witness Queen Liu, who provided the partial license plate number. Police dispatch determined that the only car in Hidden Valley with a matching plate number belonged to Oliver Vega, the defendant's father. The officers drove to the Vega home, and there they found the vehicle with fresh scratches on the left front bumper with turquoise paint in them. When the officers spoke to Ms. Vega, she was wearing a cardinal and gold baseball cap and a white t-shirt. Officer Wright placed Adrian Vega under arrest. Your Honor, the evidence will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Adrian Vega hit Cameron Douglas with her car. Adrian Vega knew she hit someone. Adrian Vega did not stop. Adrian Vega did not assist Cameron Douglas. Your Honor, the evidence will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Adrian Vega is guilty of felony hit and run. Thank you. Thank you. Does the defense wish to present an opening statement at this time? The defense wishes to reserve their opening statement, Your Honor. All right. With that, then, we'll go into the evidence at this time. Yes, Prosecution, sir. call your first witness. Yes, Your Honor. Before doing so, may I replace the diagram? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Prosecution calls Officer Kelly Wright. Officer Wright, please follow me. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring attorneys. My name is Christina Cole, and I'm Officer Kelly Wright. For the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Austin Park, and this witness's statement can be found on pages 20, 24 through 26. Go ahead, Mr. Park. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening, officer. Good evening. Please state your work and experience for the court. I've been an officer on the Hidden Valley Police Department for 12 years, and I have extensive experience investigating traffic collisions and hit and run accidents. Did you work a crime scene on the night of April 19th? Yes, I was dispatched to a hit and run incident at the corner of Skyline and Grand. Your Honor, may the officer approach the diagram? Yes. Officer, do you recognize Exhibit A? Yes, this is a complete and accurate diagram of the crime scene I worked at 10.40 p.m. on April 19th. Please show us on Exhibit A what you observed when you first arrived on the scene. When I arrived on scene, I observed the victim, Cameron Douglas, being loaded into an ambulance between the points marked C and Q on the diagram. His broken turquoise bicycle was nearby. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the officer has indicated the position of Cameron Douglas between where C and Q are marked on the diagram? The record will so reflect, yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you speak with the victim? Not immediately, as he was receiving medical attention, but I spoke to him at the nearest possible time, which was the next day. Did you speak with any witnesses at the scene? Yes, I took the statements of both Quinn Liu and Dallas DeCamp immediately at the scene. And did they provide any useful information to the case? Yes, Quinn Liu was able to provide a partial license plate number and a description of the driver. Did you take any action with this partial license plate number? Yes, I radioed it into dispatch and they informed me that only one car in Hidden Valley matched that partial. Objection, Your Honor, can you say? Your Honor, this is not hearsay, as it is an official record 
made by uh, the police department to the officer. Uh, may I respond, Your Honor? Yes. It's an out-of-court statement. Objections overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead. Had you finished your answer? No. The only car that matched the license plate number belonged to Oliver Vega, Adrian Vega's father. You may be seated. What did you do next, officer? Next, my partner and I proceeded to Mr. Vega, Miss Vega's household, excuse me, to look for the vehicle. And what did you observe when you first arrived on the scene? We observed a vintage black Bueller parked at an angle on the driveway with one tire on the lawn. We checked the license plate number and it matched the partial we'd been given. The hood of the car was warm, although it was a cold night, indicating the car had been driven recently. And finally, there were fresh scratches and turquoise paint on the bumper, consistent with the victim's bicycle. Did you search the Bueller during your investigation? Yes. Later that night, we impounded the car, and a search turned up a business card from a ULA scout under the driver's front seat and a cell phone in the center console. What was your next action, officer? Next, I approached the household and knocked on the door. A teenager came around the side of the household, and he identified himself as Tony DeLuca. Objection, Your Honor. This is hearsay. Your Honor, this is not going to show the truth of the matter that it actually was Tony DeLuca, but simply the fact that he identified himself as such. Do you have anything you think? Yeah. Um, that him identifying himself as Tony DeLuca would be offering it for the truth of the matter. Your Honor, may I be heard? Briefly. It is not of any consequence whether the uh, person was actually Tony DeLuca. That will become clear later in the case. But right now, all that matters is that the officer thought that this person was Tony DeLuca. It is the state of the mind of the officer. The objection is sustained. I don't think that's an appropriate state of mind. Move to strike, Your Honor. Motion to strike is granted. Did you interview this person? Yes, I took an interview from that person. Uh, excuse me. I took a statement from that person immediately the scene. And what happened next, officer? Next, I observed a teenage female approaching the Vega household. I initiated contact, and she identified herself as Adrian Vega. What was Objection, Your Honor, this is also hearsay. Your Honor, this is an admission, falls under the exception, admission against interest by a party opponent. Sustained. Uh, overruled. overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Had you finished your answer? Yes. And what was Ms. Vega wearing? She was wearing a white t-shirt and a cardinal and gold baseball cap, a perfect match to the suspect description. Did you, can you identify Ms. Vega in court today? Yes, she is the young lady sitting at the end of the defense table wearing a black coat and a black dress. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the officer has correctly identified the defendant? The record will reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you interview the defendant? Yes, I took her statement immediately. And what action did you take, officer? I arrested Ms. Vega for a violation of California Vehicle Code 20001A Felony hit and run. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time. All right. Cross examination. Yes, Your Honor. For the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Logan Thornley. Good evening, officer. Good evening. When did you interview Cameron Douglas? I interviewed him uh, the day after the accident. And this was also the day after you arrested Adrian Vega, correct? Yes, I had already established probable cause for arresting Ms. Vega, though. And when you spoke with Ms. Vega, she identified Tony as the driver of the car, correct? That was her statement, yes. And Tony identified Adrian as the driver of the car? That was Tony's statement, correct. And <clears throat> you were already suspicious of Ms. Vega when she approached the home and when you interviewed her, correct? Yes. And did Miss Vega ever state that she hit a bicyclist? No, she never made that statement. And when Miss, when you asked Miss Vega to repeat her story, did her story change? No, it did not. And did you receive any information from Aubrey Fox regarding the accident? Yes, I did receive some information from her. Did you act upon this information? No. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Can you redirect? Briefly, Your Honor. Right. Officer, how long did your investigation take? It continued for several days after I arrested Ms. Vega. Did you consider your investigation complete? Yes. 
Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. All right, thank you. May this witness step down? Yes. Thank, thank you. That's right. You step down. Next the witness. The prosecution calls Cameron Douglas to stand. Cameron Douglas? Just follow me. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? Yes, I do. Please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring attorneys. My name is Victor Hiltner, and I'm Cameron Douglas. And for the convenience of the court, my name is Giselle Kahn, and this witness's testimony can be found on pages 30 to 31 of the case booklet. Good evening, Mr. Douglas. Good evening. What do you do for a living? Well, for the past 10 years now, I've owned Hidden Valley's only bike shop. Do you yourself ride your bike? Why, yes. Well, I used to. It was my main method of transportation, and I also rode frequently as a hobby. Did you bike competitively? Yes. In the past, I have competed in several triathlons, both within the nation and internationally as well. What color is your bicycle, Mr. Douglas? It is turquoise. And what safety equipment do you use when you ride? Every time I ride, I make sure that I'm wearing my helmet, and when it's especially dark outside, I always make sure to be wearing reflective clothing and a headlamp so that I am very visible in the dark. Where were you on the night of April 19th, 2012? That night, I just finished up closing my bike shop, and I hopped on my bike and was headed home, and halfway through an intersection, I was hit by a vehicle. How clearly do you remember the accident? I remember everything from the night of the accident very clearly. I mean, how could anyone forget a night like that? What happened? As I was halfway through the intersection of Skyline and Grand, I looked to my right and I saw this car just racing towards me. I was hoping it would stop or slow down or something, but it just kept coming towards me and eventually hit me, sending me flying from my bicycle and just landing me right in the middle of the road. Were you hurt? I was in a tremendous amount of pain. When I hit the ground, my arms and legs were very scraped up from the asphalt. And I remembered specifically a lot of pain in my right knee. When I was brought to the hospital, I was told that my right knee had been shattered, and in addition, I'd also suffered a cracked collarbone and a mild concussion. Objection, Your Honor. The cracked collarbone and head injury are hearsay. Counsel, your response. Your Honor, it is in this witness's testimony that he received a cracked collarbone and a mild concussion. It is reasonable that he would know that he received a cracked collarbone and a mild concussion. Furthermore, the doctor's uh, diagnosis is an example of official records made in the course of business by public employees, and therefore it is an exception to the hearsay rule. Um, Your Honor, it is an out-of-court statement, and he would have had to have been told these things by a doctor for him to have known them. This is always one of those uh, tricky ones because uh, it is somewhat based on hearsay, but. Uh, person does figure out one way or another uh, what's bothering him or her. Uh, I am going to uh, overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Douglas, did you receive any permanent injury from this accident? Unfortunately, yes, I did. The damage done to my knee will prevent me from competing in triathlons ever, ever again in the future. Did the driver of the car that hit you offer any assistance? The car didn't even stop. Right after it hit me, when I was on the ground, I could just see it drive away. Did anyone else offer you any assistance? One person did come to my side briefly and then went off into the distance. A uh, second person came and stayed with me until the ambulance arrived. Mr. Douglas, can you describe the car that hit you? Yes, I recognized it to be a black Bueller. And were you able to see the driver? I was. I saw Adrian Vega in the driver's seat that night. And are you sure that you saw Adrian Vega? I'm pretty sure it was Adrian. I know her just as a member of the community. I know she's on the swim team or something like that. And I also see her driving around in that very vehicle, taking turns recklessly and paying no real attention to pedestrians or cyclists like myself. And when did you first tell someone that Adrian Vega was the one driving the car? Well, when I was lying on the ground, I tried to tell whoever was nearby me immediately after I was hit, but I was in far too much pain to articulate clearly and uh, the soonest I could tell anyone was the next day when Officer Wright came to interview me. Mr. Douglas, do you see Adrian Vega in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. She's sitting at the far left end of the defense table wearing the black coat and the black dress. Your Honor, will the record please reflect that Mr. Douglas has correctly identified the defendant? So reflect. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time. Cross, Mr. Yes, Your Honor. 
and for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Logan Thornley. Good evening, Mr. Douglas. Good evening. Did you see the driver of the car that hit you? Yes, I did. I saw Adrian Vegas, as the driver that night. But you're only pretty sure that it was Adrian, well, correct? Yes, I'm pretty sure it was her driving. But you are 100% sure that it was a black Bueller that struck you? Yes, that is the car that I recognized. Were the headlights on the car working? Yes, they were. And uh, do you, um, and you have seen a, do you remember anyone coming up to you after the accident? Yes, uh, one person came to my side briefly, and as I said, they left, and the second person came to stay with me for the duration. But you couldn't remember what these people looked like, correct? Um, no, I cannot. Thank you. And you worked long hours to get the previous mayor reelected, correct? Uh, yes, I campaigned for the other candidate. Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Douglas's political views are irrelevant to this case. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. It goes to the potential bias of this witness against Adrian Vega. Anything further on that? Submitted, Your Honor. The objection is overruled. Go ahead. And you spent 10 years, that's a third of your life, working towards biker safety, correct? Yes, I'm a huge advocate of biker safety. I just want bikers to be safe, safe when they're on the road. But the new mayor does not share your views on biker safety? No, uh, fortunately she does not. And when this new mayor was elected, you were extremely frustrated? I was frustrated, but mostly disappointed at the lack of biker safety. And would it not hurt the mayor's career if her daughter hit you with a vehicle? I have no idea how a, her daughter's conviction or lack thereof would affect her political career. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Can you correct this car? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. Mr. Douglas, would you lie in court because you disagree with Mayor Vega's policies on biker safety? <laughs> Absolutely not. That's ridiculous. I have no idea why Adrian Vega's conviction would affect biker safety in Hidden Valley. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you. All right, the witness may uh, step down. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. May the prosecution call next witness? Yes. The prosecution calls Tony DeLuca. Tony DeLuca, please follow me. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? Yes, I do. Please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring attorneys. My name is Riley Devine, and I am Tony DeLuca. And for the convenience of the scoring judges, my name is Keyshawn Patel, and this witness's statement can be found on pages 27 and 28 of the case booklet. All right, go ahead, Mr. Patel. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening. Good evening. Please state your name and age for the court. My name is Tony DeLuca and I am 18 years old. And where do you attend school? I'm a foreign exchange student from Italy at Hidden Valley High School. And do you know the defendant, Miss Vega? Yes, I do. The Vegas are the family who I'm staying with during my time here in the U.S. and I'm also on the Hidden Valley High swim team with Adrian. Now I'd like to ask you a few questions about the night of April 19th, 2012. Certainly. There was a swim meet on that night? Yes, there was. It was a very important swim meet. It was the state championship qualifying meet, and there was a University of Los Angeles scout in, in attendance, which is my dream school. And how did this meet go for you? Well, I personally didn't do as well as I had hoped, but the team did well, and that's what matters. And Mr. DeLuca, what did you do after the meet was over? After the meet was over, I told Adrian I had to volunteer at a hospital the next morning, so we went to his car and drove home. And Mr. DeLuca, did you drive the car home? No, I have never driven that car. Adrian was driving that night. Then, then could you describe how Adrian was driving on that night? Yes, she was driving very recklessly, speeding, making a lot of sharp turns, and she was also texting while driving. Did you try to do anything about this? I did. I told her to stop several times, but she wouldn't, and instead she just kept bragging about her personal performance that night at the swim meet. Objection, Your Honor, this is hearsay as to Adrian bragging about her own personal performance. Yeah, maybe here. Yes. This is not being used to prove the truth of the matter. It's merely being used to prove that it's said and heard. It is not hearsay because it's not being used to prove the truth of the matter, sir. Then I would object to relevance. No, what's the relevance? 
you know, my witness merely stating what has happened in the car during the time of the accident, just giving some foundation to the incident. The objection is sustained. I don't think it's relevant. Move to strike. The answer is stricken. Yes, Your Honor. And what happened while you were in the vehicle? Well, I felt a large bump as though we had hit something, and I immediately asked Adrian what had happened. He immediately said we hadn't hit anything. Objection, Your Honor. Although I. Your Honor, you're here? Yes. This is this falls under the exception of hearsay for admission against interest by a party opponent, showing that Miss Miss Vega was defensive over the fact that he hit something. Submitted, Your Honor. Objections overruled. It is an admission under twelve twenty of the evidence code. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. He immediately said we hadn't hit anything, although I had never asked him if we had hit anything, and he just kept driving home and never pulled over to see what had happened. And what did you do when you arrived home? When I arrived home, I went straight to bed. I was tired and just wanted to be done with that night. And were you ever interviewed by the police that evening? Yes, later that night, I spoke to Officer Kelly Wright about the evening's events. And Mr. DeLuca, did you drive the vehicle that struck Mr. Douglas on the night of April 19th, 2012? No, I did not. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Jessica Granger Jones. Good evening, Mr. DeLuca. Good evening. You want to make your family proud of you, don't you? Yes, I do. And you moved to the United States so that you could swim, so that you could swim at an American university, didn't you? Yes, that's my dream. And your dream school is the University of Los Angeles? Yes, it is. So it's fair to say that you've been working hard all year to get the scouts' attention, haven't you? Yes. And while in the United States, it is true that you have driven some of your friends' cars, correct? Yes, I have an Italian driver's license, and which is recognized as a legitimate license by the state of California. But I don't see how this is relevant as I wasn't driving the car. Um, objection, Your Honor. Non-responsive as to the last portion of his answer. Your Honor, I believe my witness was simply explaining his answer. The objection is overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. And you would do anything to reach your goal of swimming at the University of Los Angeles, wouldn't you? Yes, but within a competitive and athletic standpoint. However, you still state you would do anything. Yes, but within reason. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Any redirect, Mr. Patel? No, Your Honor. May this witness please be excused? Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Mr. Patel. Next witness. The prosecution calls Quinn Liu to the stand. Quinn Liu, please follow me. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? Yes, I do. Please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring terms. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Sophie Shen and I'm Quinn Liu, L I U. And Your Honor, before I begin the prosecution request to time check. The prosecution has five minutes and six seconds remaining and the defense has six minutes and 25 seconds remaining for their defense. Go ahead, Ms. Kahn. And for the convenience of the court, my name is Giselle Kahn, and this witness's testimony can be found on page 29 of the case packet. Good evening, Ms. Liu. Good evening. How old are you? Do I really have to state my age? Please, ma'am. Well, if you insist. I am 47 years young. And what do you do for a living? I am a general manager at Global Union Bank, and I've been doing this for the past 20 years. Do you know Cameron Douglas? Yes, I know Cameron. He seems like a nice guy. I've talked to him a couple of times. And he rides his bike around town a lot, and I really admire his devotion to the sport. Where do you live, Mizzou? I live on the east side of Grand Avenue, where it intersects with Skyline Drive. Your Honor, may this witness please approach the diagram? Yes. Diagram. Yes, that's my house, and that's my neighbor's house where I get coffee. It's the intersection of Grand Avenue and Skyline Drive. And is it complete and accurate to the best of your knowledge as of the night of April 19, 2012? Yes. Would you please mark on the diagram with your initials where you were that night? I was right next to the box labeled Q, and I was on my porch smoking a cigarette because my husband doesn't like it when I smoke inside the house. 
And did you see Cameron Douglas that night in his name? Yes, I saw Cameron. He was riding his bike, and I saw this black car start coming up. And I was thinking, this car's got to stop. It's going to hit Cameron. And I shouted, look out! And he didn't hear me. The car totally creamed him. His body went flying into the air, and he landed on the ground. Basically, were you able to see what part of the car hit Mr. Douglas? Yes, it was the Project left relevant. Your Honor, this is relevant to this case. It is, been, that it is part of the case that the car has hit Mr. Douglas with his left front bumper where there were scratches found. Furthermore, this establishes that the witness could clearly see what was going on. Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. It is not in dispute as to which portion of the car um, hit uh, Cameron Douglas, um, but rather that Cameron Douglas was hit. The fact that a certain portion of the car um, hit Cameron Douglas is irrelevant. The objection is uh, overruled. The answer can stand. Go Thank ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Liu, would you please mark on the diagram where you saw Mr. Douglas? I saw Cameron going towards the northeast corner of Skyline and Grant Avenue. <coughs> and he was a little over halfway before he got hit. Ms. Liu, would you please mark on the diagram with an arrow the direction of the car that hit Mr. Douglas? I saw the car going north. Your Honor, may this witness please be seated? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Liu, can you describe the car that you saw hit Mr. Douglas? The car was black, and I also did get a partial license plate. I'm, I work at a bank, so I really like working with numbers, and right when I saw the license plate, I immediately made out the numbers and got it, which was SLC 86. And are you sure that the numbers were SLC 86? Yes, because after I saw it, I kept repeating it to myself, and then I ran home, wrote it down, and called 911. Were you able to see the driver of the vehicle, Ms. Liu? I was able to see what the driver was wearing. The driver was wearing a cardinal and gold baseball cap, a white t-shirt, and from <coughs> where I was standing, I could also see the glow of a cell phone screen. So what did you do after you saw Cameron being hit by the car? Well, I was concerned, of course. He just got hit by a car. So I quickly ran to Cameron to see if he was okay. He was breathing. His body was limp, though. And I ran back home and called 911. Ms. Leo, what did the car do after hitting Cameron Douglas? The car hit Cameron, slowed down, and sped off. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time. Thank you. Cross-examination, Ms. Johnson. Yes, Your Honor. And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Emily Johnson. Good evening, Ms. Liu. Good evening. Now, it was hard for you to see on the night of the accident, correct? Yes, but I have good vision. And isn't it true that it was cloudy? That, that is true. And dark? Yes, that is true. And isn't it true that five out of the six street lamps weren't working on the night of the accident? Yes, that is true, but I was standing near a working street light. And now, regardless of this positioning of the street light, isn't it true that the light would have illuminated the accident? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, may this witness approach the diagram? Yes. Uh, please go ahead. Now, can you please reiterate um, by pointing and verbally the direction of the vehicle on the night of the accident? The vehicle was going north when it hit Cameron. And then can you also uh, reiterate where you were? I was on my porch smoking a cigarette right next to the box labeled Q. So now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that puts you on the passenger side of the vehicle, correct? That is correct. And you say that you saw the driver wearing a white t-shirt, correct? Yes. And you were only able to identify or de describe one person in the vehicle, correct? Yes. Now, considering that you were on the passenger side, isn't it more likely that you would have seen the passenger as opposed to the driver? I'm just telling you what I saw. Um, can you elaborate as to what you saw? I saw what the driver was wearing, a cardinal and gold baseball cap, a white t-shirt, and I did see the glow of cell phone screen. Your Honor, may this witness please be seated? Yes, sir. Now, you just described the physical characteristics that you could see um, about the person that was in the vehicle. 
Uh, could you please, or were you able to see the face of the driver? No, and I'm totally kicking myself for not being able to see the face of the driver. So this means that you could not identify the driver of the vehicle, could you? No, and I'm so kicking myself. And you knew Cameron prior, uh, Cameron Douglas prior to the incident, correct? Yes, we've talked to him a couple of times, and he seems like a nice guy. In fact, you have admiration towards Cameron Douglas, correct? Yes, he rides his bike every day. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. A redirect, Ms. Trump. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Liu, were you able to see the accident clearly? Yes. And are you sure of what you saw? Yes. And are you certain that you saw the driver when you described the clothing and the cell phone? Yes, I'm sure I saw the driver. And would you say that you know Cameron Douglas well? We've talked, talked a couple, couple of times. That's it. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lee, may be seated. Step down and be seated. Thank you. At this time, the prosecution moves that the exhibit, barring the markings made on it, be entered into evidence. Any objection from the defense? Once the markings have been erased, there are no objections. Okay. Would you prefer that I erase the markings now or wait till later? You can do them later. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> All right. The prosecution rests. We will rest. All right. At this time, uh, does the defense wish to give its opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Please proceed. And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Emily Johnson. <coughs> Tonight, the prosecution has presented you with an elaborate work of fiction designed to convince you of Adrian Vega's supposed guilt. However, their carefully crafted story does not align with the facts. Your Honor, the case that is being brought before you today is one where jealousy paired with reckless driving led to a brutal accident. Adrian Vega and Mr. DeLuca, who had lived in Italy for most of his life, were both members of the Hidden Valley Highlander swim team. They both had the dream of excelling in their sport and attending the University of Los Angeles. Naturally, because of their similar desires, they became competitive. On the night of April 19, 2012, this rivalry was heightened at a state championship qualifying swim meet in which the two would compete. Adrian, after the meet had ceased, was approached by a scout from the University of Los Angeles, leaving Mr. DeLuca feeling left out and disappointed. After the meet, Adrian and Mr. DeLuca got into Adrian's car to leave. The prosecution has attempted to place Adrian in the driver's seat of the Black Wheeler GT. However, Mr. DeLuca was the person truly controlling the vehicle that night. Adrian was too excited to drive the car, so Mr. DeLuca drove instead. What followed was the reckless driving of an 18-year-old who had his driving experience in Italy. The outcome was Mr. DeLuca failing to perform his duty after an accident, which brings us here today. Today, Dallas DeCamp, an eyewitness of the crime, will recount the events of the accident and will provide a truly objective account of the events. Furthermore, he will share his experience with the police department that will show negligence in officer rights investigation. Next, another member of the Highlander swim team, Aubrey Fox, will inform you that Cameron Douglas was extremely zealous and would do anything to get Adrian's mother, the mayor, out of office. Subsequently, Adrian's swim coach, Taylor Burrard, will tell you of Adrian's good character and how she is a very responsible driver. Finally, the defendant, Adrian Vega, will recount what really happened on the night of April 19th, in turn, showing her innocence. Despite the prosecution's best efforts tonight, their story will never be anything more than a work of fiction because it is unsupported by the evidence. Your Honor, the prosecution has the burden of proof in this case, needing to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Adrian Vega was the driver of the vehicle when Cameron Douglas was hit. After all the evidence is presented tonight, you will see that they have not met this burden of proof. We ask that you see past the prosecution's fictitious story and base your verdict on the facts in this case, which clearly identify Adrian Vega as not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. All right, uh, will the defense call their first witness, please? The defense calls Dallas DeCamp to the stand.
Alice Kim, please rise. Follow me. Alice Kim, please rise. Follow me. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. And please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring attorneys. For the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Nicholas Heath. And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, once again, my name is Emily Johnson. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. DeCamp. Good evening. Please state your age and school you attend for the record. I'm 20 years old and I'm a sophomore at the University of Los Angeles. I'm majoring in political science. Now, prior to this court hearing, did you have any personal relationship with the victim? No, I didn't know him. And where were you on the night of April 19th, 2012? Well, I was out watching a movie with my friends, and I drove back home to my house, which is near the intersection of Skyline and Grant. And did you see anything unusual occur that night? Yeah, when I got out of my car, I looked over at the intersection, I saw a bicyclist crossing, but then this black car came speeding out of nowhere and slammed into him. And were you able to see this bicyclist prior to the incident? Yes, he was wearing white headphones and looking down at his MP3 player. Now, were you able to clearly identify the model of the vehicle? Well, of course. I know a lot about cars. It was a black Bueller GT, probably from the early 1960s. Did you see anything else occur in the intersection at this time? Yeah, I saw my neighbor, Quinn, run down to the victim and then run back into the house to call 911. What did you then proceed to do after Quinley went to the house? Well, as soon as I knew the bicyclist was hurt, I ran to him and I stayed with him until the ambulance arrived. I felt really sorry for him because I couldn't imagine how horrible it must have been to get hit by a car. What occurred when you were with the victim? Well, he mumbled a few things, but I couldn't understand anything he was trying to say. He didn't even tell me who was driving the car that hit him. And did the police interact with you in any way after the accident? Well, yeah. I was given a brief interview by two police officers afterward. I later called back the police station because I felt I might have been able to give them more information, but they never responded to my call. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further at this time. Cross-examination? Oh. Yes, Your Honor. Once again, for the convenience of the scoring judges, my name is Keyshawn Patel. Good evening, Mr. Mr. Camp. Good evening. Now, Mr. Douglas was wearing a headlamp while he was biking on the night of the accident, correct? Yes, he was. And you say the car that struck him was going about 35 to 40 miles per hour? Yeah, it was going way too fast. Now, isn't it true that this was a posted 25 mile per hour zone? Yes, it is. And this was a metal on metal crash between a car and a bicyclist, correct? Yeah. Objection relevance? Your Honor, I'm laying foundation for my next question. Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. The fact that it was a metal on metal collision, collision is irrelevant. <clears throat> Overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. So, knowing this was a metal on metal crash, wouldn't it be safe to say this would be a fairly loud crash? Um, I guess so. Now, you very clearly described the vehicle that struck Cameron Douglas as a vintage Black Wheeler GT, probably from the 1960s era, correct? That's correct. And are you certain of your identification of this vehicle? Definitely. I know what I saw. And after the accident occurred, the car seemed to slow down for a bit, correct? Well, a little bit, but not much. But then it just sped away, didn't it? Yeah. And after the accident occurred, you went to Cameron Douglas' side until ambulances arrived on the scene, correct? That's correct. And he was obviously in an enormous amount of pain, for he had just been in a hit and run accident. Definitely. And when he tried to speak, when he tried to speak, it came out more as a mumble? Yeah, I couldn't understand anything he was saying. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Can you read the Yes, Your Honor. Were you able to see clearly on the night of the accident? Well, of course. And going along uh, this path, were you able to see the model of the car correctly? Yes. And lastly, what occurred when you were with the victim? Well, he tried to mumble some things to me, but he didn't tell me anything. I couldn't understand anything he was saying. And did he tell you who the uh, driver of the vehicle was? No, he didn't. Thank you, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next witness, Your Honor. Yes. Defense calls Taylor Burrard to the stand. All right. Taylor Burrard, please follow me.
raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. And please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring attorneys. For the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Julia Ayers. And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Logan Thornley. Good evening, Ms. Farrar. Good evening. Could you please state your age and occupation for the record? I'm 34 years old and I'm a private swim coach. Do you know Adrian Vega? Yes, I'm her swim coach. And how would you describe Ms. Vega? Oh, she's very mature for her age, very responsible, great kid. How do you know she is responsible? Well, her parents are always telling her about the caution she should take as a driver and be very aware of distracted driving and she always takes her advice very seriously. And do you know Cameron Douglas? Yes, we're in the same bike club together. And is Cameron very uh, boisterous at these meetings? Yes, he's always saying something negative about Mayor Vega and it gets quite drastic like he wanted to do this huge protest and take over Grand Avenue. And do you think this is too much? Yes, I think a simple petition would suffice. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Oh. And once again, for the convenience of the scoring judges, my name is Keyshawn Patel. Good evening, Mr. Rock. Good evening. Now, it's true that you've been Adrian Vega's personal swim coach for the past five years, correct? Yes and that you want her to do well because you're training her for the 2016 Olympics. Yes, I've had my own personal experience at the Olympics, so I feel I can really get back to these students. And this would reflect positively on your career if one of your swimmers reaches the Olympics? I suppose, but I'm more focused on my master's degree. But, Ms. Sparrow, this would reflect positively on your career. Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered. Sustained. Yes, Your Honor. And Mr. Rard, you testified that the defendant is a responsible person, correct? Yes. And would it change your opinion in any way if you learned that the defen uh, that multiple people had seen the defendant driving recklessly around town on numerous occasions? No, because my personal experience with her is that she's very responsible and mature. So no amount of evidence would change your opinion of the defendant? Objection, Your Honor. This is outside the scope of this witness. No. Your Honor, I believe this witness would have enough knowledge to answer this question about what she thinks about Ms. Vega. Mr. Thornley? Then I would also say this is, calls for, this is calling for speculation. The objection is overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. Yes, please. So no amount of evidence would change your opinion of Ms. Vega? I'm pretty strong on my opinion of her. And Ms. Burrard, you've never been a passenger in her car while she was driving, have you? No, I have not. And you also testified that the defendant is a mature person, correct? Yes. So she would never do anything dishonest, such as disobeying her parents, would she? Not that I know of. And you would not want to see Ms. Vega convicted of this crime, would you? No. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Redirect, Mr. Foreman. Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. Ms. Burrard, um, would you lie to protect Adrian Vega? No, I wouldn't. And is, um, it, which is more important to you, your master's degree or getting Adrian to the Olympics? My master's degree. And so you would not lie for Adrian, even if it were to help your career? No, I would not. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Right, may may this step. witness be excused? Yes. yes. You may step down. Right. Next witness. Defense calls Aubrey Fox to the stand. Aubrey Fox, you follow me. At this time, defense requests a time check. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring attorneys. For the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Kiana Lee. And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Logan Thornley. All right, so the defense has 10 minutes and 40 seconds remaining, and the prosecution has 7 minutes and 25 seconds remaining. Good evening, Ms. Fox. Good evening. Do you know Adrian Vega? Yes, I do. How do you know Adrian? I've known her for years, since I was five years old. 
And do you know Tony De Luca? I mean, yeah, I know him. And did you see Tony on the night of April 19th? Yes, I did. And where did you see Tony? Well, I was celebrating with our student body about our swim team's win at our state championship qualifying meet. And I saw them. They were standing, I saw Tony and Adrian. They were standing about 50 feet away next to Adrian's dad's car. I noticed that Tony was wearing a light blue shirt. He Imagine, was, Your Honor, non responsive and the witness is lapsing into a narrative. Sustained. Move to strike the answer. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Fox, could you, from where you were standing, how far away was Tony? 50 feet away. And could you clearly see Tony? Yes, Tony was wearing a light blue shirt. And so despite all that was going on with the celebration, you are confident um, in seeing Tony? Yes, he was standing by the driver's side of the car. Thank you. And do you know Cameron Douglas? Yes, I do. How do you know Cameron? I am a biker, and I talk to Cameron on occasion. Cameron is very concerned about the needs for bikers. He feels that the mayor isn't doing enough, and he once told me that he would do absolutely anything to get the mayor out of office. Objection, Your Honor, hearsay? May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. It goes to the state of mind of Cameron Douglas. Just park. For that limited purpose, submitted, Your Honor. All right. For that limited purpose, it is admitted the objections are ruled. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right. Cross, Mr. Park. Yes, Your Honor. For the convenience of the scoring judges, my name is Austin Park. Good evening, Ms. Fox. Good evening. Now, you've known the defendant since he was five years old, is that right? Yes, we were both five years old. She's been such a great friend. It's been awesome getting to know her. And like you say, you've been close friends this whole time, correct? Yes. You wouldn't want to see the defendant convicted of this crime, would you? No, because I know that she's very honest, and I trust her, and I know that she would never do anything Objection, like that. Objection, Your Honor, non-responsive. I did not ask why this witness would not want to see the defendant convicted of the crime. Mr. Foreman. I believe she was merely explaining her answer, Your Honor. The objection is uh, overruled. The answer can stand. Yes, Your Honor. You were at a Hidden Valley swim meet on April 19th, correct? Yes, I was. I'm so excited because we won and the state championship qualifying meet. It was, it was a great night for me. You saw Tony Luca and Adrian Vega that night, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you saw Tony Luca standing by the driver's side door of the vehicle, correct? Yes. You say in your witness statement you were taken by surprise that the defendant would let Tony Luca drive the Bueller. Is that correct? Yeah, I was surprised because Tony is a horrible driver. The reason for your surprise was that Adrian Vega never let anyone drive his Bueller, correct? That is true, yes. But you never saw Tony DeLuca driving the Bueller that night, did you? No. Please answer yes or no. I saw Tony standing by the car and it looked to me like Tony was going to drive. Your Honor, objection. Speculation as to Tony was going to drive. She cannot tell from the position of Tony that he was going to drive or not. Mr. Thornley. Nothing to add, Your Honor. All right. It is uh, speculative as uh, stated. Um, so that. Move to strike just the last portion of the answer, Your Honor. The last portion of the answer is stricken. So let's be clear. You did not see Tony DeLuca drive that night, did you? No, I did not. You did not see Tony Luca holding car keys, did you? No, but I didn't see Adrian drive either, so... You didn't see Tony Luca open the driver's side door? No. You didn't see Tony Luca get in the driver's seat? No, but I did see Tony standing by the driver's side, and it looked to me like Tony was going to drive. We are well aware. <laughs> now, you didn't see Tony Luca or Adrian Vega leave that night, did you? Objection, Your Honor, that is a compound question. Your Honor, may I rephrase? Yes, the objection is sustained. You didn't see Tony DeLuca leave? No. You didn't see Adrian Vega leave? No. So you don't know, with any certainty, who was driving that night? I don't know, but Tony was standing by the driver's side. So, to me, it looked like Tony was going to drive. Objection, Your Honor, speculation. Again, can we strike the last portion of the answer? Uh, I'm going to uh, overrule it. I think the way the question set it up uh, brought it in, so. Yes, Your Honor. You did not, 
you have no idea who was driving that night, do you? I am not certain, but it looked to me like it was Tony. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. All right. Do you have any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. You said you thought Tony was a horrible driver. Why? I have been in a car with Tony before, and I know that Tony has a bad habit of running through stop signs. Objection, Your Honor. Improper character evidence. Referring the court's attention to page 52, under the subheading, Character Evidence, evidence of a person's character or a trait of his or her character is inadmissible when offered to prove his or her conduct on a specified occasion. The prosecution anticipates that they are going to use this character evidence to prove that a Tony DeLuca was more likely to be driving. May I respond, Your Honor? Sure. I did, uh, the witness did not testify to only one specific instance. She was testifying to a habit that she does know that Tony has. It is in her witness statement. May I be heard, Your Honor? Yeah. I'm not objecting to lack of personal knowledge. I'm objecting to improper character evidence. Whether or not she has knowledge is not my issue at this time. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. It's not improper character evidence because it is not, not one specific instance. Your Honor, may I be heard? Last chance. <laughs> I'm not saying that she only observed one specific instance. Rather, I'm saying that the specific instance they are using, she is using the character evidence to prove the specific instance on April 19th. I did not hear one, uh, her mention one specific instance, Your Honor. Yeah, I, I didn't see the, the, the objections overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Miss Fox, would you lie under oath to protect Adrian? No, of course not. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. May this witness be excused. Yes. Thank you. The final witness. Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls the defendant, Adrian Vega, to the stand. Adrian Vega, please follow me. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please be seated and state your name for the convenience of the scoring attorneys. For the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Caroline Jersted. And for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Jessica Granger-Jones. Good evening, Ms. Vega. Good evening. Now, could you please state your age and school you attend for the record? Yes, I am 18 years old and right now I'm a senior in Valley High. Do you have any hobbies? Well, yeah, ever since I was a kid, I have loved swimming. I compete all the time. So were you at the swim competition on the night of April 19th? Yes. And is there anything in particular about this swim competition that makes it stand out? Well, yes, not only was it the um, state qualifying championship meet and we won, so that was very exciting, but I also got approached afterwards by the scout from my dream school. So how did you feel about the scout approaching you? It was very exciting because that's what I've been working for. And so it was really a dream come true. So what did this excitement lead you to do? Well, I was very ecstatic, and all I wanted to do was text my parents and my family and tell them what had happened. And so naturally, I let Tony drive home, which was a horrible mistake. So Tony drove home? Yes, he did. And how was Tony's driving? He was an awful driver, going way too fast, and it was a windy road. And was there anything that occurred in the car to make Tony's driving even worse? Yes, it was, um, it was actually really awkward because he wasn't saying anything. So I tried to talk to him and break the silence, but then he just seemed to get really upset and he took my hat saying I didn't look good in the school colors and he took my phone and started pretending to text people and pushed on all the buttons. So did anything happen shortly after this? Yes, uh, very shortly after I felt that we, or um, he hit something. And what did you do after you felt like Tony hit something? Well, I immediately told him to pull over and he didn't. And did you eventually get Mr. DeLuca to pull over? Yes, after a while down the road, he did pull over. And do, what did you do when he pulled over, when he pulled over? Well, I had to drive home because not only had he been driving awful, but now he had hit something. So did you drive home? Yes, I drove the rest of the way home. And what did you do when you reached your house? Well, when I got home, I just needed to get out of the car because all these events had happened so rapidly. So I just parked the car and got out and went for a walk and just tried to relax. So how were you feeling when you got home? I, Every, it was overwhelming because I had been from overenjoyed about getting my dreams about to come true and then all of a sudden 
I made a horrible mistake and I let Tony drive and he drove awfully and he hit something with my father's car. So I was just completely overwhelmed and I just tried to walk and just find out what the responsible decision would be. So would you ever lie under oath? No, never. And did you drive away from the swim meet on the night of April 19th? No, Tony drove the car. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time. Cross, Ms. Uh, Carr. Yes, Your Honor. For the convenience of the court, my name is Giselle Kahn. Good evening, Ms. Vega. Good evening. Your father's car is a vintage expensive model, is that correct? Yes. And he has explicitly told you not to let anyone else drive this car? Objection, Your Honor, this car? is hearsay. Your Honor, this is not going to prove the truth of the matter that uh, asserted rather, well, excuse me. Um, this is an exception to the hearsay rules. It shows the state of mind of the defendant in that no one is allowed to drive this car, but, and so therefore, she knows that no one is allowed to drive this car. The honor of the state of mind exception refers to the state of mind of the usherer, not the listener. Anything further? Then I would say that this is for the effect upon the listener, Your Honor. The objection is sustained. I don't think this is appropriate state of mind. You have gotten her around. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Vega, you never let anyone drive that car, is that correct? Yes. You never have let Tony DeLuca drive that car before the night of April 19th, is that correct? No, I do not. So, on this one night of all nights, you claim you let someone else drive? Yes, I was way too excited and all I wanted to do was text. It was a five mile drive home. I didn't think it could have ever been that bad. So you were texting in the car? Yes, I'm in the passenger seat. I was texting my family and telling them what had happened and all my friends. And you were wearing a cardinal and gold baseball cap? Yes, I was until Tony grabbed it and said I didn't look good in the school colors. You were wearing a white t-shirt? Yes, I was. And you say that Tony stole your hat and phone? Yes, he stole my hats. He said I didn't look good in school colors, and then he took my phone and started mocking me. Did Tony DeLuca ever steal your t-shirt, Ms. Vega? Well, obviously not. You heard a loud crash when you were driving, is that correct? I felt an impact, yes. In your statement, you say you felt a crash as well? Oh, well, yes, that's an impact, yes, yes. a crash. So, you could both hear and feel that the car objection is a compound question. Objection is uh, overruled. Go ahead and finish the question. You could both hear and feel that the car appeared to have struck something. Yes, it is something. Okay. Did you stop the car, Miss Vega? I was not driving. I could not stop the car. Did the car stop at any point after hitting something? Yes. After a while, Tony finally pulled over. And why did Tony pull over? Because I told him to, and I kept telling him to. Mm -hmm. Why did you want him to pull over? I mean, he had just hit something with my father's car and had been driving horribly the whole night. Of course he had to pull over. Did you drive back to the scene after getting the wheel from Tony DeLuca? No, I would, just wanted to get home. We were so close, and I just needed to figure out what the responsible decision would be. So you just drove home? Yes. And when you got home, you saw that there were scratches on the left front bumper of the car. Is that correct? Yes, I did. At that point, did you go back to the scene of the accident? No, I just, I never could have assumed that it was that bad. It was just a few scratches on the front. I don't know what it, I did not know what it was. You didn't contact the police? No, not at that time. I went for a walk, and by the time I got back, the police were already there, so I felt no need to. So you didn't contact the police or drive back to the scene. You just went for a Objection. walk. Objection. This is a compound question. It is compound. Sustained. So you just went for a walk. Is that correct? Yes, I went for a quick walk to figure out what to do. And what you really needed to do was figure out what to tell your parents. Is that correct? Yes, and I was also trying to figure out what the responsible decision would be at that time. You decided to tell your parents that Tony DeLuca was driving? I told them the truth, yes. And you knew your parents were going to be furious. Furious with what? Because you let Tony DeLuca drive your car. Yes, absolutely. It was a horrible mistake. But not as angry as they'd be as if you had been the one to drive the car, hit something, and leave the scene. Is that correct? No, they would have been much more Rejection, angry Objection, speculation. I your Honor, the witness will know whether or not her parents will be more angry about her committing a felony or letting a friend drive her car. This is not calling for speculation. It is still speculation as it is the opinion of a lay witness. Objection is uh, overruled. Had you finished your answer? No, may you please repeat the question? 
you knew your parents were not going to be as angry as they would be as if you had been the one to hit something yes. and drive away. Is that correct, Ms. Vega? Well, of course, they would have been furious if I would have ever drove in that reck recklessly. Yes. Ms. Vega, the University of Los Angeles is your dream school, correct? Yes, I've been working very hard to get in. And you're hoping to compete in the 2016 Olympics? Yes, if everything goes well, that should happen. But wouldn't a felony conviction destroy your chances of going to the University of Los Angeles? Objection, speculation. Your Honor, this is common sense that universities are not generally accepting of felons into their <coughs> freshman classes. I, I, I don't know. I could make a joke about that, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. Uh, seeing as Ms. Vega has no personal relationship to the university, as she is not an employee, she would not be able to make a holistic judgment as to whether or not this would affect her chances. Anything further on this, Ms. Carr? Uh, yes. As a senior in high school, Ms. Vega will have, would have been actually applying to universities and likely has a great deal of information at her disposal about universities, specifically her dream school, as she mentioned, the University of Los Angeles is. Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. Her merely applying to schools does not mean that she is able to tell uh, whether or not she would be able to be admitted based on um, her character. Right. I'm going to sustain the objection. Move to strike? Yes. Ms. Vega, a felony conviction could destroy your dreams, couldn't it? Objection, Your Honor. This is still speculation. Ms. Carr. Ms. Vega's dreams are to go to the University of Los Angeles and compete in the Olympics. These are both difficult things to do while in jail for a felony. Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. This is what we argued over the last question, so you merely rephrased it. I'm going to sustain the objection. Ms. Vega, did you ever return to the scene after arriving home? No, I did not. I never could have assumed that that would have happened. But you could tell that your car had hit something, couldn't you? Yes, it, it did hit something. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Is there any redirect, Ms. Granger-Jones? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Vega, how were you feeling after you switched places with Tony DeLuca? I was just, I was exhausted, I was frustrated, and I just wanted to get home. We were so close. So, when you arrived home, what did you do to clear your mind of these emotions? Well, I just went for a brief walk because I was locked out of my house. I just tried to figure out what was the best decision to make. So after you went on this walk, had you figured out what the best decision to make was? Yes. And uh, before making contact with the police, were you able to call them? No, by the time I figured out what to do, the police were already at my house when I went back. And by the time you figured out what to do, were you able to return to the scene of the accident? No, the police were there at my house, so I could not leave. And would you ever lie under oath? No, never. And did you drive away from the swim meet on the night of April 19th? No, I let Tony drive. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions at this time. This witness may be excused. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vega. Now, with that, the uh, defense rests? Yes, Your Honor. The defense rests. All right. Closing arguments, Your Honor? Yes, we've reached that stage. The evidence is in, and the parties will have an opportunity to argue the case to the court. Uh, the prosecution will go first. Uh, Mr. Park, are you prepared? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. She just drove away. She left Cameron Douglas laying broken in the street. Until now, Miss Vega has been able to escape responsibility for her crime. That ends today. Today, the prosecution has met our burden of proof on each of the four elements of felony hit and run. We have shown first that Adrian Vega was driving. Second, that Adrian Vega permanently crippled Cameron Douglas. Third, that Miss Vega knew she had hit someone and fourth, that she neither stopped nor offered assistance. For this, Adrian Vega is guilty of felony hit and run. The second and fourth conditions are not in dispute today. It is stipulated that Cameron Douglas's right knee is permanently injured, and we know that the defendant did not stop or offer assistance to Cameron Douglas. So this case comes down to two questions. Was Ms. Vega driving, and did she know she had hit someone? Let's start with the second question. The Bueller was traveling north on Skyline as Cameron Douglas rode east on Grand. 
the Buick struck Cameron Douglas with its left front bumper. So not only was Mr. <coughs> Douglas the closest witness to the incident, he was also directly in the driver's line of sight. The Bueller was speeding through the intersection, but after the collision, it slowed down. Miss Vega knew she had hit someone. In that moment, her fear fought her conscience. Fear won. Miss Vega fled, leaving Cameron Douglas to die. Have you ever heard a car crash? It is loud and it is unmistakable. Adrienne Vega acknowledged this loud crash in her testimony. Anyone who has heard a loud crash would automatically check their rear view mirror to see if they had hit something. A simple glance would reveal Cameron Douglas laying broken in the intersection. Tony Luca's headphones may have muffled the sound, but he still felt a large impact, and he asked Miss Vega what happened. She immediately defended herself. We didn't hit anything. She didn't say, I'm not sure what happened, because she was sure. She saw the bicyclist. She heard the sound of her car slamming into D Cameron Douglas's bike and body, and she felt the impact that shattered his right knee, broke his collarbone, and sent him flying through the air. This brings us to the last question. Was Miss Vega driving? Both Tony DeLuca and Cameron Douglas place Adrian Vega behind the, driver, behind the wheel of the car. Tony DeLuca's statement is 100% consistent with the evidence we've heard today. Quinn Lu, Tony DeLuca said he saw the light of a cell phone, in, excuse me. Tony DeLuca said the driver was texting and driving recklessly. Tony Lu, Quinn Lu saw the light of a cell phone in the car and Dallas DeCamp said the car blew through a stop sign at 35 to 40 miles per hour. What's more, Quinn Lu saw that the driver was wearing a white t-shirt and a cardinal and gold baseball cap. These same colors the scout had given the defendant earlier that night. Cameron Douglas's identification of Adrian Vega is undeniable. When Mr. Douglas looked out from his bike, he was only a few feet away, and the driver was directly in his line of sight. He didn't have time to stare, but he didn't need it. We all know that human eyes can recognize visual cues in a split second. Cameron Douglas saw Adrian Vega driving the car directly before he was struck. It is a concrete fact. The defense called on Aubrey Fox to say that she saw Tony DeLuca standing by the driver's side door of the Bueller before Mr. DeLuca and Adrian Vega left the swim meet. She did not see Mr. DeLuca driving, and she never has. Excuse me, she's never seen Mr. DeLuca driving the Bueller. This is because as she testified, Adrienne Vega never let anyone else drive her father's precious black Bueller. Now in a minute, the defense is going to get up and tell you that Adrienne Vega is a good guy. She may be, but that does not make her innocent. That's the problem with the defense. Their theory is based on the defendant's testimony. Her testimony alone. Adrienne Vega is the only one claiming Tony DeLuca drove the Bueller. Adrienne Vega is the only one lying to protect her freedom and her future. The prosecution has brought two witnesses placing Adrian Vega in the driver's seat. We have evidence that the defendant matched the suspect description given by Quinn Liu. We have evidence that the defendant would never let anyone else drive her father's Bueller. The prosecution has met our burden of proof on each of the four elements of felony hit and run, and we have proven beyond any reasonable doubt that Adrian Vega is guilty. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Park. All right, uh, Ms. Granger-Jones, you're going to deliver the closing argument for the defense? Yes, Your Honor. At this time, the defense uh, requests a time check. The defense has seven minutes and 11. And again, for the convenience of the scoring attorneys, my name is Jessica Granger-Jones. Your Honor, tonight the prosecution has presented you with an elaborate work of fiction designed to convince you of Adrian Vega's supposed guilt. However, their carefully crafted story does not align with the facts. There are two victims in this case today. The first is Cameron Douglas, who was hit with a car while riding his bicycle on the night of April 19th. And the other victim is the defendant, Adrian Vega. Miss Vega has been wrongfully accused of a grave crime. Adrian Vega has been brought before the court today, charged with a violation of California Vehicle Code 20001. However, Miss Vega is innocent. The prosecution is faced with the burden of proof. 
to prove their accusations beyond a reasonable doubt, but they have not done this. What the prosecution presents as facts is merely a work of fiction. Adrian Vega did not drive away from the swim meet on the night of April 19th. Your Honor, Adrian Vega is innocent. After the swim meet, Adrian was too excited to drive. Trying to make the responsible decision, she allowed for Mr. DeLuca to drive them the five miles back to the Vega residence. However, uh, Mr. DeLuca, who had his driving experience in Italy, was unable to fulfill this simple request. Aubrey Fox testified before you today that she even saw Mr. DeLuca standing by the driver's side door after the swim meet. In the driver's seat, loathing began to arise in Mr. DeLuca as he clutched the steering wheel and drove recklessly. His horrible driving was also testified to by Aubrey Fox today. And Mr. DeLuca's already reckless driving became even more erratic due to his jealousy. He grabbed Adrian's hat and phone. Not paying any attention to the road, he ran a stop sign, hitting a bicyclist on the north side of the intersection between Skyline and Grand. Adrian testified today that she tried to get Mr. DeLuca to pull over and finally managed to farther down the road. The Hidden Valley Police Department's investigation was fraught with bias and unreliability. On the night of April 19th, uh, Officer Kelly Wright was faced with two reasonable interpretations of the accident. Officer Kelly Wright interviewed Tony DeLuca, who testified to Miss Vega's guilt, and uh, interviewed Miss Vega, who testified to Mr. DeLuca's guilt. However, instead of investigating both of these claims, Officer Wright chose to ignore the latter and conduct an incomplete investigation. <coughs> Much of the prosecution's case rests upon the lies of Tony DeLuca. The Italian exchange student was hospitably taken in by the Vega family. And how does he repay their generosity? By accusing the Vega's daughter, Adrian, of a crime that Mr. DeLuca himself committed. Mr. DeLuca testified today that he would do anything to reach his goal of swimming at the University of Los Angeles. He also testified that he wants to make his family proud. Being convicted of a felony is no way to get into university or gain the respect of one's family. Panicking about the possible consequences of, consequences of his actions, he decided to blame the only other person in the vehicle that night, Adrian Vega. Now, to fulfill their burden of proof, the prosecution also relies upon Cameron Douglas's identification of Adrian Vega being the driver of the vehicle that night. However, Mr. Douglas is mistaken. Dallas DeCamp, a non-biased eyewitness of the accident, testified before you today that Mr. Douglas was looking down at his MP3 player before being hit. Mr. Douglas was distracted and would have been blinded by the oncoming headlights. Thus, he would not be able to clearly see the driver. Because of this, Mr. Douglas testified that he is only pretty sure that Adrian Vega was the driver of the vehicle that night. Instead, he was more concerned with the car identification, which he was able to confidently describe as being a black Bueller. Adrian Vega's car. Because the car belonged to Adrian Vega, Mr. Douglas made the assumption that Adrian was driving that night, and the reckless driving fit his already low opinion of Mayor Vega, thus leading to him to his mistaken identification of Adrian Vega being the driver of the Black Bueller that night. The prosecution also uses Quinn Liu's observations as proof that Adrian was driving that night. Quinn Liu testified today that she saw somebody in that car wearing a white t-shirt. However, where Miss Liu was standing, she would have been closer to the driver's side, to the passenger side, excuse me, of the car. Thus, the person who, whom Quinn Liu actually saw in the vehicle that night wearing the white shirt was the passenger, Adrian Vega. Your Honor, Adrian Vega is as much a victim in this case as Cameron Douglas. Adrian has been the victim of the lies of the prosecution, and she should receive justice. Tony DeLuca was the one to drive away from the swim meet on the night of April 19th. Tony DeLuca was the one to hit Cameron Douglas with a black Bueller, and Tony DeLuca was the one to fabricate a false story in a desperate attempt to clear his name by placing the blame upon Adrian Vega. Your Honor, the prosecution has not met their burden of proof. Their fictitious story does not prove beyond a reasonable doubt Miss Vega's guilt. In a case that relies upon circumstantial evidence, a case such as this, if there are two interpretations of the evidence, one pointing to innocence and the other to guilt, the trier of fact must choose innocence. Your Honor, the defense asks that justice be upheld and Adrian Vega be found not guilty.
Officer Ark, any rebuttal on part of the prosecution? Yes, Your Honor. What sounds more like an elaborate work of fiction? Cameron Douglas disliking the mayor of Vegas policies concerning bikes and possibly making up a story that may or may not send Adrian Vega to jail in order to somehow improve bikers' rights in Hidden Valley? Or two concrete identifications of Adrian Vega behind the wheel of the car? Regardless of Quinn Lu's position, she was focused on the driver. She saw the driver wearing a white t-shirt. Only the defendant had one on. Aubrey Fox saw Mr. DeLuca near the driver's side door of the Bueller. She did not see him holding keys, she did not see him behind the wheel, she did not see him drive, and she never has. This is because Adrian Vega was driving. As Aubrey Fox testified, Adrian Vega never let anyone else drive her father's precious black Bueller. We request that you adopt a verdict of guilty for the crime Adrian Vega has committed. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Park. Ms. Granger-Jones, yes, uh, rebuttal. Your Honor, Mr. Park relies upon the identifications of Tony DeLuca and Cameron Douglas, who identified Adrian Vega as being the driver of the car that night. However, Mr. DeLuca has an obvious motive to lie, seeing as he was the actual driver that night and would not want to be convicted of a felony. Cameron Douglas also only stated that he's only pretty sure that Adrian Vega is the driver. A tentative identification does not fulfill the prosecution's burden of proof. Furthermore, Mr. Lucas only stated that Miss Vega was the driver after Miss Vega had already been arrested. Officer Wright could have easily let the fact that Adrian Vega had been accused slip, and Mr. Douglas seized this as a chance to hurt the mayor's reputation. The lack of physical evidence turns this case into one reliant upon circumstantial evidence. And in a case reliant upon circumstantial evidence, if there are two interpretations of the evidence, one pointing to innocence and the other to guilt, the trier of fact must choose innocence. Your Honor, the defense asks that justice be upheld and Adrian Vega be found not guilty. Thank you, Ms. Ranger Jones. Thank you, uh, prosecution. Thank you, defense. As uh, the uh, defense argument pointed out, uh, this is a circumstantial evidence case, and uh, the defense attorney stated the uh, jury instruction correctly. There are two reasonable interpretations of the circumstantial evidence, and uh, one of those reasonable interpretations points to guilt and the other points to innocence. You must adopt the reasonable interpretation that points to innocence. Maybe it's the old prosecutor in me, but I always remember the last sentence of the instruction, which says that however, when evaluating circumstantial evidence, you must adopt reasonable interpretations and reject any that are unreasonable. Too many years of that ingrain that in my mind. Uh, the question here becomes, in this case, is the argument that's been presented by the defense in this case uh, about the motives, the tentative identifications, the statements that are made by the witnesses and the testimony of the defendant herself, whether those are reasonable interpretations that point to innocence. And when evaluating this, there are just a lot of questions that are raised in the court's mind about the uh, validity and the uh, veracity of the defendant's testimony more than anyone else in this case. And uh, you have the testimony of uh, Cameron Douglas, who admittedly is biased against the defendant's parent, the defendant's mother. And uh, you also have uh, Tony DeLuca, who may uh, be somewhat uh, uh, biased as well. Uh, but you have to accept that one time in many, 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 many times, all of a sudden the defendant allows someone else to drive the car. And you have to ask yourself, well, does that make a lot of sense? Is it reasonable? You know, we are dealing with 17 and 18 year olds here, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of experience in that area, but uh, <laughs> but again, you have to take it and uh, decide if that's reasonable. And uh, I, 
after listening to all the evidence and considering the law, I do find that uh, in this case the only reasonable interpretation is the one that's been presented by the prosecution and therefore the court finds the defendant, Adrian Bacon, guilty of the crime of violating Vehicle Code Section 20001A, a felony. And uh, with that, I know that the uh, scorers have to uh, give their scores. But with that, uh, you've completed it. You've done it. Give yourselves a hand. I know it's been a long road, and I know just from personal experience, I've known a number of you uh, out here uh, since you were much, much younger, and uh, to see how you've all progressed and the wonderful job that you've all done uh, is just fantastic. To the, uh, to the attorney coaches and the teachers, a uh, big thank you for all the time that you put in. Um, this type of case is very difficult. Um, I, I had a case actually before me a couple of years ago that had somewhat similar facts. Um, so actually some, where someone was very, very badly injured who was a bicyclist in a hit and run accident and he's been unable to compete since then. That actually uh, was something that I ended up handling as a judge. And so uh, it's this type of fact situation is an extremely difficult one. This Miranda problem that you see is something that we deal with every single day. And in fact, I have a little file in my cabinet and the case of Berkmer v. McCarty is in it. So uh, it's something that we deal with every single day in the court system, this particular problem. So um, I know that uh, the judges are giving their uh, getting their scores together, and uh, best of luck. Uh, both sides did an outstanding job. Uh, it really shows that all those hours, all that preparation that you put in really paid off. As I like to say, um, I know for some of you here, I mean, you're able to, to do several things at once, but this is like doing a winter sport. Uh, some people might be doing basketball. Uh, if someone here is able to combine both, I don't know how you do it, but. Uh, uh, but the time that is put in, the hours, the effort, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, the presentation that you put forth is um, outstanding. Uh, it's as good as and sometimes better than uh, what we see. You know, we'll be reminded of this tomorrow morning. Uh, but uh, this, is a, this is a very difficult case. It's a tough fact situation. And so uh, again, Congratulations to each and every one of you. Uh, thank you all for doing this. And uh, to the parents, thank you for your support of your children. Um, it's great to see all the parents here uh, supporting. And again, to the coaches and the teachers, I know this is a lot of time and a lot of effort. So once again, congratulations. <laughs> in a very close result, the team who came in second place in the county of Santa Cruz for 2013 is Scotts Valley High.